Good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, be uh, here to this afternoon to present a set of results that we recently obtained in uh, my laboratory that is located in Italy in the uh, eastern part of Emilia Romagna. And uh, I would start with my financial disclosure that you see here in this slide and uh, to discuss the agenda of uh, this uh, speech uh, that will be just a brief introduction, uh, discussing the experience of the Emilia Romagna region, uh, discussing about the specimen collection type and priority in, proce in processing, uh, discussing something about the diagnostic and screening test for the detection, the laboratory detection of COVID-19 infection, and in particular to discuss the role of antigenic assay and the role of the molecular testing in these uh, 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 di diagnostic workflow and telling you some of the experience uh, of my laboratory and at the very end some uh, take home messages just to be uh, uh, open for discussion. So this is the background in which we moved since uh, uh, February 2020. Uh, this is a series of uh, a newspaper uh, that report uh, uh, the alarm that was uh, uh, ramping up uh, during that month uh, uh, because of the explosion of the epidemics. I, I, I uh, would like to remind you that uh, Italy was the first uh, uh, Western country that was involved in the pandemic after China. And this was uh, in some way a, a, a very challenging situation because we were not completely prepared. And uh, uh, we, of course, tried to develop as fast as we could the uh, response to this pandemic. Uh, what we have now available for the diagnostic test, diagnostic detection of SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, of course, we have molecular testing that have been developed since the very beginning of the epidemics. Uh, we have different type of molecular testing uh, uh, based on different technology, different uh, target genes, but basically all of those tests are uh, related to the collection of nasal of throat swabs that contains supposedly infected cells. And then uh, using different techniques, uh, the amplification of the viral RNA is achieved and tells us if the people that we are testing is infected or not. Of course, we have also antibody testing that can be used for the uh, detection of the immune response against the infection. And uh, the very last development that was made available on the market is a, a set of antigenic tests that can be used for the detection of viral related antigen or viral related portion of antigen by different methodology from the rapid diagnostic test to uh, chemiluminescent assays for the detection of antigens uh, in the same sample as the molecular test, nasal swabs, basically. So uh, if you look back at the WHO guideline issued on September 11, 2020, you, you see very clearly that the target analyte is the virus nucleocapsid protein that is preferred because of, of, of the relative abundance of these antigen in respect to other viral components. Uh, the sample collection material should be provided in the commercial kit and the results are read by the operator within 10 to 13 minutes with or without the aid of a reader instrument. The test, uh, antigenic test uh, for the rapid test uh, required nasal or na nasal or nasopharyngeal swab sample. And uh, more recently, it has been also stated that these tests can be used also with alternative biological sample such as saliva. The performance requested was uh, very high with the sensitivity uh, above 8% and the very, very high specificity that must be uh, higher than 97%. Uh, the optimal time for the collection and the performance of this test 
should be within the first five to seven days following the onset of the symptoms, and the shelf life should be one to one and a half uh, uh, months, and the shipping temperature is at room temperature. Uh, why should we go for the uh, possibility to use antigenic test? Of course, the first opportunity is to diagnose SARS-CoV-2 infection where NAAT is unavailable. That means when we cannot perform any molecular testing or when we have a very long extended TAT of real-time PCR that makes these uh, uh, results obtained by real-time PCR not clinical, clinically useful or for rapid investigation of different outbreaks involving community like nursing homes, cruise ship, prisons, workplace and the school and so on. And the, the, the last opportunity for the use of antigenic test is the widespread community transmission that uh, uh, can be controlled by using this kind of an approach. Well, it's really still unclear which could be the viral load uh, that uh, uh, is supporting the status of uh, contagiousness uh, by individual tested persons. The antigen-based test could help to rapidly identify people who have high level of virus and those, the, those who are most likely to be infection to other and isolate them from the community. That means, in other words, that the one possible role of antigenic test is also to identify uh, in a very fast and effective way all the, end, all the person that are capable to transmit the infection. And the role of molecular test is uh, a little bit different because scientific study report that there is a strong relationship between the so-called cycle threshold or CT value and the ability to recover infectious viruses by using uh, cell cultures. Uh, in general, a cutoff for the RT-PCR CT value above 33 is associated with non-infective sample detected within the first five to seven days following the onset of the symptoms. The persistence of the symptom, mild to severe, is in general correlating with prolonged viral RNA shedding and recovery of infectious virus. That means, in other words, that we need to have a larger panel of studies that can allow us to state that one person is not infectious uh, when a defined CT value is detected by RT-PCR. Um, there are a lot of study. I, I'm going to show you uh, some of the most relevant, in my opinion, that can predict the infectious, severe, acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus due from diagnostic sample. If you see here, there is a good correlation between the cycle threshold or CT value and the probability to have a positive results in cell culture. You see very clearly that when the CT value is ranging above 25, uh, the probability to have a culture positive result is really low. And uh, of course we have a different opportunity. We should improve the, uh, we have two different possibility. Uh, on the one hand, we can improve the frequency of testing, or in the other hand, we need to improve the sensitivity of our test uh, and, and to in increase, not to increase the frequency of testing. So this is a very nice paper published very uh, nicely some uh, months ago that clearly states that if you test one population with a high analytic sensitivity test, such as PCR, uh, or if you test with the lower analytical sensitivity test, you add, but, but you use this second test, low analytic sensitivity with a higher frequency of testing, you can very easily pick up uh, th with the same uh, sensitivity, all the positive subjects. That means that if you are going to use a lower sensitivity test, you need to increase the frequency of testing. 
uh, again, another test that another paper that reports the correlation between CT value based on amplification of one single gene, because I, I remind you that the CT value are strongly linked to each single gene target and to each single methodology of amplification. So for this defined test, uh, the CT uh, up to 25 means that uh, up to 70% of the patient remain positive in culture, while if you go for a CT value of 30, this value drops to 20%, and the CT value of 35, less than 3% of the culture are positive. So there is a strong correlation between the CT value, again, once again, and the possibility to isolate the virus in cell culture. Um, one debate that is still open in these days is uh, which COVID-19 test could be accepted to obtain the so-called Green Pass certificate, that is the certificate that allow people to travel without too much restriction, at least within the EU. Um, so far, only the so-called net test, including RT-PCR and TMA and rapid antigenic test that are uh, enlisted in a, in a council recommendation that you see here the, is the 2021C24-01 uh, can be used to, to release a digital green certificate. Um, Self-testing is not included. And uh, there are listed 83 rapid antigenic tests, but no one uh, antigenic test performed in the laboratory. And this is quite uh, uh, difficult to understand because we know for sure, and I, I'm going to show you some data, that the antigenic tests performed on laboratory instrumentation are uh, at least as sensitive and specific as the rapid antigenic test. And you see here a very nice review made by the Cochrane Library on rapid antigenic tests. So far, they in, in the find the uh, website they in, uh, in January 2021, um, 129 red were uh, enlisted and 92 were uh, regulatory approved in that list. So you see here that there are very different results according to the subgroup subgroup of of tests used and the population. Uh, most of the tests has been, uh, has been have been performed on symptomatic population. You see here the uh, more than 15,000 sample, while on a symptomatic, only one tenth of the total test that was, uh, was used. used. Uh, again, one week post onset or more than two weeks post onset with high viral load and, low, and, and lower viral load. So there is a lot of difference. You see here, the average sensitivity is ranging from 58% or 51% or even at 41% for the most difficult uh, people to be identified up to 70 or 95% in people that are clinical evident within one week. So there is a huge uh, uh, difference in between these different tests according to the uh, setting in which you uh, apply this. I'm gonna try to skip over this because this describes just my healthcare organization. Um, well, we are a, a public funded consolidated laboratory that serves a network of 14 different hospitals that uh, uh, in a, uh, and, and we are serving about 1 million and 200,000 population located in the eastern part of Emilia Romagna. We work basically with the nasopharyngeal specimen for the diagnostic of COVID-19. And basically our uh, collection system is based on UTM or VTM uh, in nasopharyngeal swabs. So it's a very standardized system worldwide. Um, which is our workflow. We serve, uh, as I told you, a, a network of hospital plus all the old outpatient of the Area Vasta Romagna. The sample are collected with, uh, from patient with suspected uh, symptoms. And in the highest part of the epidemic, uh, that was probably beginning of March, we were processing a little bit more than 6,000 samples 
per day by PCR and about 1,000 samples per day with uh, uh, screening asymptomatic antigenic assay. The samples are transferred to the laboratory where they are processed, that they are classified according to this kind of uh, traffic lamp that state that red code is to uh, be processed within two hours from the arrival, Gr yellow means six hours, and uh, green means up to 24 hours of, from the arrival in the laboratory. Um, this is the, a, a series of specification that uh, are required for our testing, for the antigenic testing in the, in the laboratory. And uh, we, we performed this very simple study that was uh, uh, to evaluate a new regimen of high throughput antigenic testing to the that frequently in, with, with a very high frequency of testing the asymptomatic infected individual which are the primary source of materials. And we tested 1,000, a little more than 1,000 uh, UTM uh, co collected na nasopharyngeal sam samples uh, performed on a clear automatic analyzer. And to all of the uh, positive and negative tests were uh, confirmed by using a real-time PCR after extraction and purification. What uh, the population that we studied was uh, more or less this one. So schools, nursing home, uh, closed community, healthcare providers, uh, and people work, uh, living in, uh, in nursing homes. All the positive antigenic tests were confirmed by real-time PCR. Uh, this was the sample workflow for the screening surveillance study. So the collection site was in the directory or in the hospital. And uh, uh, in order to process the, uh, the sample by antigenic testing, uh, you can keep the, the, the sample already collected uh, up to 12 hours at the two to eight break, the, the degree Celsius. When the sample arrives in the laboratory, there should be a viral inactivation steps uh, that takes uh, some 30 minutes. And then you go for centrifugation and run the test uh, in the laboratory. Uh, so these are our findings. We tested, as I just told you, in January 2021, uh, a little bit more than 1,000 asymptomatic individual. And you see here that by going with the 200 TCID 50 threshold, we found the sensitivity of 90.5% with the specificity of 99.8% compared to PCR, of course. You see here the uh, comparison in between the uh, antigenic test and the PCR results. And this test was showing a very high positive predicted value by an extremely elevated negative predicted value. That means that as for a screening test is a very reliable test. Well, in conclusion, uh, we can state that with this new assay, we observed a greater sensitivity and a better traceability than what is currently indicated in the literature or in the fine database for the so-called rapid antigenic test that could be performed just near the bed of the patient or in doctor's office or but outside of the laboratory. So by using this chemiluminescent automatic analyzer combined with the test that detect the uh, SARS-CoV-2 antigen, we can state that this test is suitable for mass screen routine and that offer a new regimen of high throughput up to uh, realistically uh, a little bit more than uh, 1,200 over a shift of eight hours. So it's feasible. Uh, it provides a high throughput antigen testing that can be used for increase the frequency of testing in asymptomatic suspected infected people. And this is very useful because these category of people, I mean, the asymptomatic infected person are the primary source, the primary tank from which the virus can be transmitted to other people. And so uh, sustaining the viral circulation and the viral spread. 
I, I would like to uh, provide some uh, uh, very few uh, take-home messages. Uh, well, the rapid diagnostic answer is uh, in less than three quarter of an hour with a high throughput platform that can perform up to 130 tests per hour. It can be uh, useful to stop the COVID-19 transmission through target isolation and cohorting of the most infectious cases and their close contact. And this is also uh, uh, feasible with the cost of test that is much, much lower than any and uh, molecular technology-based technique. Uh, another possible advantages of implementing this kind of test is to expand the access to testing. That means you can screen a larger proportion of the population. And on the same time, you have the high advantage to guarantee the traceability because all of this system is based on barcoded cubes and barcoded readers that are inside the instrument. That means you do not need to write with the pencil on a, a rapid antigenic test the name of the patient and you don't have trouble with uh, 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 the right time to read the test and so on. So uh, it's, a, it's a very stable and traceable system that can be implemented in any single laboratory. And uh, of course, the increased frequency of testing that is possible according to the use of these different antigenic detection solution is capable to maximize the capacity to identify all the positive asymptomatic individuals. So I, in conclusion, I would say that this kind of antigenic testing is a good alternative for selected population, for selected group of suspected people to have a, a good approach that can improve our capability of contact tracing and at the very end to control the pandemic. Um, and I thank you for your attention and I will be more than glad to take any question you may have. Thank you. Good afternoon. So uh, now I'm going to speak about the use and impact of a rapid molecular assay for COVID-19 diagnosis. Uh, just to introduce the context, I work in the virology laboratory of uh, our hospital group, and uh, we receive respiratory samples from three main locations in eastern Paris, uh, Trousseau Hospital, Saint Antoine, and Tenon Hospitals. Um, the samples are mainly from hospitalized patients. Uh, of all ages, so uh, adult patients, including immunosuppressed, uh, but also pediatric patients, uh, elderly patients, and pregnant women with two maternity wards. Uh, and now concerning COVID-19 only, we also did the diagnosis for our staff. So we received some samples from our medical and non-medical staff from all three hospitals. And uh, before year 2020, of course, the, the diagnosis of respiratory viruses was uh, following the, the rhythm of winter epidemics. And so we detected a, a high number of, of samples positive for influenza uh, during a few weeks uh, in winter from uh, usually December to March, and a high number of samples positive for respiratory syncytial virus during the bronchiolitis epidemics, uh, so usually from uh, no, no, between November and February. And uh, in our laboratory for this diagnosis of respiratory viruses, uh, uh, we perform either a multiplex PCR with a um, detection of, of a classical large range of 18 viruses all year long and uh, also an additional technique to uh, detect detecting only influenza and RSV, uh, but with a faster turnaround time. And so this allows uh, to obtain a rapid answer when it's needed all year long, especially for influenza, like uh, to help for uh, 
uh, antiviral treatment decisions. And uh, additionally, the, 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 other, the, the restricted technique allows to test uh, more samples and faster during the winter. And then uh, coming to year 2020, of course, like uh, everybody else, we had to face, face the COVID-19 diagnosis and uh, the avalanche of a huge, some, huge number of samples to test. And so since uh, March 2020, we implemented um, several successive molecular assays in our laboratory, from the first in-house PCR to uh, several commercial assays. In our case, uh, four assays uh, well, uh, adapted to large series and two assays for rapid testing. In the beginning, we had, as everyone else, we had to face some initial uh, supply disruptions. And in the same time, we had to become able to test more than 400 uh, samples a day, which uh, is uh, uh, four times more than usual for us. And for that, uh, the, the main criteria for the choice of techniques were the practicability, the compatibility with equipments that we already had in the lab, and of course, the analytical performances of the essays. Uh, in France, the evaluation of the essays are listed on an official website, and uh, those initial evaluations are mainly conducted by the two reference laboratories and then verified in each individual diagnosis laboratory. So among other essays, we, we decided to use the simplex essay Previously, we had an experience with the simplex assays uh, for HSV and for influenza RSV. And so just to give you a few details about the COVID-19 essay on the liaison MDX, um, it's an easy to use molecular assay. Everything takes place uh, on the disk that you see here above. It's uh, possible to test from one to eight samples uh, at the same time with only 50 microliters of uh, samples as input. Uh, first, the, the reagent and samples have to be distributed and then the disk is sealed and placed inside the liaison MDX and a centrifugation inside the machine um, makes the reagent and sample drop into a, a calibrated compartment below and um, there, there is a fluid check process to ensure that reagent and samples are put properly in the correct volume without inversion. And so it's, uh, it's supposed to be impossible to obtain the false negative result in case of uh, if by accident the samples uh, was not loaded. And so afterwards, the, the laser opens the sample valve to let the sample drop inside the reaction chambers chamber, which is uh, below, still on the disk. And then the next step is incorporated extraction, which is in fact a lysis with combined heating and centrifugation to release the nucleic acids. And then the laser opens the reagent valve to let the PCR reagent uh, rejoin the nucleic acids. And the PCR is uh, performed uh, with 40 cycles of amplifications. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, and uh, the, the entire process requires exactly 80 minutes. Uh, the amplification is detected by a real time fluorescence measurement. Uh, so at the end of the PCR run, the, the amplification curves are uh, visible, as in these examples of a positive sample, a negative sample in the middle with the uh, amplification of uh, the internal control only, and uh, on the right, an invalid sample with no IC amplification. And a positive result is defined by a dual amplification of uh, the two SARS-CoV-2 genes, uh, S and of one. And uh, the qualitative results and the cycle thresholds uh, results are uh, detailed on the report. And uh, of course, the liaison MDX can be connected to the central computer system. In our experience, the, the rate of invalid samples is low, uh, 
Uh, it can occur in case of uh, the presence of PCR inhibitors or because, uh, because of a failure in the reagent distribution, like uh, probably in the case of the graph of this invalid. And it can also occur in case of problem in the sample distribution. And in this case, the report uh, indicates insufficient sample volume. But in our experience, uh, invalids are not so frequent. So uh, initially, the, the simplex I say was has been evaluated in, by the National Reference Center in Lyon, and their conclusion was uh, sensitivity similar to their reference technique. And then in our laboratory, we conducted an evaluation, local evaluation as well. And uh, here you can see the cycle threshold differences between the result by, a simplex, by the simplex ISA and by the ISA that we used as a reference when the same sample was tested in parallel, in parallel by both essays. And the mean difference was three CT with uh, CT always earlier by the simplex ISA compared to the comparator. And the same difference was observed for clinical samples and for quality controls. So meaning that uh, this is not related to the parameters of the samples like uh, viscosity. Or... And then on the left, on this blonde Altman representation, uh, we observed that uh, the CT difference appears to be a variable according to the level of genome in the sample with uh, CT really earlier for high viral load samples and uh, less early for uh, low viral load samples. And one interpretation of this profile uh, could be an influence of the small sample input, input in the simplex ISA, and maybe a PCR, uh, maybe a little less efficient uh, on low viral load samples. And uh, apart from the evaluation of the simplex ISA, of course, we. We, which is represented here again on the on the right. Uh, we conducted similar evaluations for other techniques. Uh, all I say that uh, we we uh, tested uh, to use potentially for a routine use. And uh, here is a summary of the, these evaluations. And uh, to summarize, we found equivalent performances uh, between I say B, C, and E. Uh, knowing that B is a manual PCR in plate, uh, C is an automated PCR in plate, and E is a, a different uh, unitary uh, test. So these three essays were equivalent and similar to the in-house PCR, which is essay A. And then uh, concerning technique D, which, uh, which is another automated PCR in plate, we were surprised to see results uh, very dissimilar with a uh, CT much earlier, as you see on the graph, technique D versus C. Uh, on all the viral load range, we had differences of around minus 10 CT between technique D and the comparator assays. And, and um, most surprisingly, this, uh, this earlier CT values were not related to better sensitivity uh, by this SAD when uh, we did uh, additional dilution experiments. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, concerning the, the interpretation of the PCRCT, of course, it gives a semi-quantitative estimation of the level of genome in each uh, sample. But uh, I want to mention that it will always remain a semi quantitative because of the lack of standardization between because of the the possible impact of uh, the quality of sampling and uh, obviously the, the CT is uh, very dependent on the kinetics uh, of the infection and uh, this parameter of the PCR CT can be important for clinical monitoring like uh, for example for the follow-up of severe cases or for evaluation of the therapeutic efficacy, like uh, for, for instance, in patients uh, treated with monoclonal, specific monoclonal antibodies. And here on this graph, you see an example of the gradual uh, evolution of the CT value uh, on sequential specimens from one patient 
uh, who was hospitalized in intensive care unit and uh, with a prolonged viral expression and with eventually a negativation of the PCR, uh, but after uh, more than 50, almost 50 days. And so when interpret, interpreting the PCR CT, uh, it has to be mentioned, mentioned that the, the technique may have may have a strong influence. And here you see the CT values uh, on the samples from the same patient, but tested in parallel by two different assays with uh, globally with technique uh, C versus uh, D. And as expected uh, from the evaluation that we did just before, uh, the, the difference on the same sample can be up to 10 CT, like uh, for example, uh, for one specimen, uh, CT15 by one assay and 25 by the other on the same specimen. So, and uh, the same uh, the same phenomenon can be uh, observed here for a second patient with again differences of up to 10 CT on the same sample, uh, tested by two different assays. And even in the end, in the end, a qualitative discrepancy with one specimen tested positive by one essay and negative by the other. And we observed similar results for many other patients. So the, the PCR CT is of course an important information, but uh, it needs to be interpreted with caution. So I'm now coming to the, to the simplex essay. Uh, it is proposed as a uh, suitable for a rapid answer on SARS-CoV-2 genome detection. So appropriate, especially when a rapid diagnosis is required with uh, giving a result in 80 minutes, the results are expressed uh, in a semi-quantitative manner with a CT value. Uh, so from our evaluation, we, um, we can, we can speculate that the, the level of genome by this essay can be a little bit overestimated, uh, but overall we measure the good sensitivity, um, even if the, the sensitivity might be slightly reduced for, uh, for very weak samples. And so there is a low risk of false negative results on very low viral load samples. The essay is very easy to use with uh, it needs very little technical work. So it's appropriate uh, even in a context of users with, uh, with basic skills in molecular biology, in uh, emergency laboratories, in uh, to work at night or during the weekends, or in case of uh, reduced uh, workforce. And the amplifications of the amplification of SARS-CoV-2 and influenza RSV is possible on the same disk. So this might be useful in the future uh, in anticipation of possible concomitant epidemics. And so for, for all these reasons, we decided to, after the initial evaluation, we decided to use the simplex I say as a routine essay in our laboratory. And we processed more than 10,000 samples by this essay uh, in one year in our laboratory. And this represents approximately 10% uh, of the, the total number of the samples that we received in, in the lab for COVID-19 diagnosis. And globally, the results were totally concordant with the clinical data of the patients. So we, we have a good clinical agreement and um, the detection was not defeated uh, because of variants so far. So whereas this, this could have been a problem because of uh, the detection in the S region. But uh, in our experience, we observed discrepancies only for a few cases, uh, mainly with the low viral, for low viral load samples. So, so impossible to sequence and to explore further. Uh, with the simplex ASA, we obtained uh, good results on the annual external quality evaluation uh, panel. And of course, the, the main advantage of this kit is the fast turnaround time, which uh, makes the ASA particularly appropriate for testing urgent samples. 
And uh, this is exactly the way we use the, the essay in any situation where uh, a COVID-19 diagnosis is required rapidly. So either to identify positive patients, of course, but also in any situation where we need to, to check for a negative result, like uh, before surgery, before hospitalization in double room, which is a unfortunately a frequent situation in our hospitals, or before transfer of the patient to another location like a follow-up care unit, etc. And so uh, to conclude, the, the potential use of, the, of such a rapid uh, answer uh, essay can be on its own for an activity of around 40 specimens a day but not more unless you, you want to exhaust the machine. Uh, or it can be implemented beside other equipments for, uh, to manage large series to create a parallel rapid workflow for urgent samples. And this is how we are organized in our laboratory. So after having tested uh, several different essays, in the end, we only kept two essays, uh, one automated, adapted to large series of samples and allowing to obtain uh, several dozens of results in four to five hours, and the Liaison and DX to process small series of one to eight urgent specimens and giving a, a rapid answer in 80 minutes. So the organization is similar to the one we had for influenza. And uh, then I would like to, to finish uh, by uh, thanking all my colleagues from the Virology Laboratory in Trousseau, saint antoine tenon headed by Laurence Morin-Joubert. I thank all the technicians who did uh, an impressive work. Uh, some of them are listed on, on, the, on the right of the picture. And um, I want to thank all my colleagues from the hospital group and Diastron Molecular, and Mr. Alexandre Marie. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Aurelie. I think that uh, your talk is very familiar to everybody. I think working in the diagnostic laboratories, uh, we're having six different platforms for doing uh, diagnosing one virus. It's uh, well, I think it's very familiar to most of us. Okay, well, we're going to switch now. Uh, we're going to uh, immunology. And for that, we have a, a speaker from the United States. And the good things about this format now is that he definitely will not have a, a jet lag. So that, that's the good news. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Vincent Streva, who's uh, uh, the director of the Sherman Abrams Laboratory in Brooklyn, New York. And he's going to talk about the SARS coronavirus immunity, innovative approaches for seroconversion monitoring. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me uh, at this session on SARS-CoV-2. Today, I'm going to be focusing on serology, and I'm going to be telling you about SARS-CoV-2 immunity, innovative approaches for seroconversion monitoring. Uh, my name is Vincent Striva. I am the Associate Laboratory Director at Sherman Abrams Laboratory, which is a private clinical reference laboratory in Brooklyn, New York, here in the United States. So today's talk will have three main objectives um, that I wish to convey. Uh, the first is talking about the latest innovations in SARS-CoV-2 serology assay design using trimeric spike protein as capture antigen. The second is looking at the immune response of individuals uh, naturally infected with SARS-CoV-2, specifically looking at data in a study we did using trimeric spike uh, capture antigen assay versus uh, an RBD-based IgG assay for SARS-CoV-2. And the third is immune status monitoring post-Pfizer vaccination. Um, and this is a study in healthcare workers that is currently being performed in Alessandria, Italy. So just to position uh, those three learning objectives in terms of who I am, um, I'm going to give you a little background about our laboratory. So we are a relatively small independent clinical reference laboratory located in Brooklyn in New York City. Um, we predominantly serve the greater New York City area, so the five boroughs of New York and the surrounding suburbs um, and states. So the timeline of COVID here in New York in the US starts in very early March 2020. 
Um, our first New York State COVID case was March 1st, uh, 2020. By this one week later, March 8th, there were over 100 confirmed cases in New York State. And by two weeks after that, March 23rd, we had over 20,000 cases of COVID here in New York. Uh, PCR testing for COVID, the rollout here in the United States was particularly bad. Um, and this is probably true elsewhere as well. Um, testing was very limited and access to supplies for PCR testing was very limited early in the pandemic. So March and April um, were very rough here in terms of uh, ability to test people for COVID. But most laboratories here in the United States had COVID PCR testing online by the end of March or early April, 2020. And most labs, uh, IgG serology testing came a bit later, um, mid to late April. So this is just to give you an idea of what COVID did to our laboratory in terms of impact on operations. Um, we went from our test volume or our order volume through 2019 was fairly steady between 15 and 20,000 orders per month. Um, but as you can see, once May, once May 2020 comes and we have COVID testing available in-house at numbers where we're actually able to perform testing, um, our volume quadrupled and then again, more than doubled. So we're, we're nearly um, six times our volume of what we were a year ago. Um, so I'm quickly going to talk a little bit about our initial validation of SARS-CoV-2 antibody tests. Um, so the first question to ask back in April of 2020 was how do you decide on samples for accuracy validation without any comparator assays uh, to use to compare to? So we were fortunate in that we were able to gather serum from patients uh, post PCR positivity, so more than two weeks after a PCR positive result, and we were able to use those as our um, expected positive uh, sera. And then we had archived sera from June of 2019 that we were able to use as our expected negative sera for our assay validation. We evaluated three methods initially back in April of 2020, um, and this is based on the available instrumentation in our laboratory, and these three assays differed a little bit from one another. All were um, spike-based assays. One was an RBD, receptor binding domain, total antibody assay. One was a spike one, spike two, S1, S2, IgG assay. And the other was a receptor binding domain, IgG assay. So we had 40 expected positive and 40 expected negative that we tested on these three platforms. Um, you can see that the sensitivity for all three assays was roughly similar. Um, either 37 or 38 out of the 40 expected positives came out positive um, on each of the three assays. We did see a few more differences with specificity. Um, specificity ranged from 90% for the uh, total antibody-based assay, that total antibody assay that we did, to 100% for the S1, S2 IgG assay that we used. And so at the time, there was, again, remember this is April of 2020, there, here in the United States, there were a lot of very bad lateral flow immunoassay tests on uh, being flooding on the market. Um, and so providers knew that these lateral flow immunoassay tests were not uh, accurate. And so everyone was very concerned with specificity at the time. Everyone was very concerned that they would get um, a false positive result. Um, from something like uh, another coronavirus, a seasonal circulating coronavirus, or another respiratory virus. So at the time, we opted for the S1, S2 assay in our lab because it showed uh, the best specificity in our hands, and we were trying to avoid false positives. However, we did do a small study um, comparing 400 specimens on all three platforms, and perhaps unsurprisingly, different platforms yield different results. Of the 400 specimens that we tested on all three platforms, there's roughly a 90% pairwise agreement rate between any two platforms. Um, so then just to, again, give you an idea of what our numbers looked like uh, in our laboratory, um, this is the PCR tests done by our laboratory throughout, since the beginning of the pandemic to now. Um, including PCR positivity rate. So you'll see in March of 2020, we did very few PCR tests, again, because reagents were in very short supply. However, we had an astonishingly high positivity rate. Um, three quarter, nearly three quarters of our PCRs were positive for SARS-CoV-2. Um, by April, we were able to get a few more PCR kits in the door and start 
running a few more PCRs. Um, and we still had an astonishingly high positivity rate in April of 2020, nearly 50%. Fortunately, by May of 2020 and through the summer of 2020, the positivity rate here in New York uh, declined significantly. And we had a relatively quiet summer. And then around the winter holidays in 2020 and beginning of 2021, um, here in New York, as well as in most of the United States, there was a bit of a, another wave where positivity increased again. Um, we were you know, nearly 20% in January of 2021. Fortunately, now in uh, June, I guess we're now in July of 2021, uh, we are down at around 1% positivity. So we seem to be, I think in large part due to the success of vaccination, we seem to be um, on the, uh, keeping a relatively low rate of positives. What about serology testing? So again, serology came into our laboratory at the very end of April of 2020. So I'll present May start data starting from May of 2020. Um, in May of 2020, we had a roughly 50% IgG positivity rate, and that continued roughly similar numbers throughout the course of the pandemic. Um, just signaling that we pretty much had a very early hit of COVID before we had the ability to diagnose it here in New York. Um, and many of our patients in our patient population were already seropositive for COVID. And now if we see what's occurring um, up to date as we go through 2021, you'll see that seropositivity rates are increasing and we're now at around 80% seropositivity, COVID IgG positivity, um, thankfully in large part due to vaccination. Um, so we did publish early in the pandemic in June of 2020, a study of about 30,000 SARS-CoV-2 IgG results from patients that we tested in May of 2020. We were one of the first um, laboratories to publish a seroprevalence study of New York City. Um, we did this in the Journal of Diagnostic Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. Um, and we saw some interesting things, only one of which I'll mention here today because of time, and that's that at the time, uh, no one was really sure whether uh, children and adolescents really got sick from COVID. Um, and we showed that, in fact, the IgG prevalence in those populations was actually the highest when we binned it out um, in five-year age groups. And so that, at the time, was interesting, but I think now has been um, shown by various other groups as well. Um, what about COVID IgM? So for a long time, I resisted the urge to bring IgM testing on board uh, at our laboratory. And it was because of, I had questions on results and how to interpret uh, COVID IgM serology results. So this study in uh, Nature Medicine from last year looked at antibody responses to SARS-CoV-2 in patients with COVID. And Basically, the long and the short of it is that there's no consistent seroconversion pattern for IgM. So if we look um, here, roughly one third of patients on the bottom left chart here uh, have IgM seroconversion earlier than IgG. This is what we would expect for infectious disease, what we see for most infectious diseases, what we would call a normal seroconversion pattern, IgM for IgG. However, the right two graphs show that in the other two thirds of patients, Either there was synchronous seroconversion of IgG and IgM, or in some cases, IgG seroconverted earlier than IgM. So how do you then interpret IgM in this context, along within the context of, context of persistent IgM that had also been reported? So um, I pushed back for a long time because I didn't see the clinical utility of using, uh, of getting IgM results, however, um, in late 2020, China required COVID IgM for travelers. Our patient population in particular areas is um, very high, a very large number of Chinese and Chinese American uh, people. And so we had a lot of pressure to bring COVID IgM testing on board. I won't say much about it. We brought it on board at the beginning of this year, 2021. Um, and our positivity rates have been uh, relatively consistent um, for, for the year between 20 and 40%. So I'm going to now move on to the first objective of this talk, talking about the latest innovations in SARS-CoV-2 serology assay design, particularly um, the use of trimeric spike protein as a capture antigen. So 
most of us know that as the prevalence of a disease increases, the negative predictive value of a disease decreases. So the likelihood that a negative result in a high prevalence population actually represents a negative patient is um, relatively poor. And here I want you to think of prevalence in this case as IgG against SARS-CoV-2. So in the background of uh, vaccination, as more people get vaccination and antibody prevalence in people begins to increase, um, the negative predictive value of SARS-CoV-2 serology tests uh, will begin to decrease. And you always have a trade-off in a serology assay between sensitivity and specificity because you have to choose a cutoff. And I think many early SARS-CoV-2 antibody assays were developed with low disease prevalence in mind. Um, so remember early um, in the pandemic, people were very concerned that seasonal coronaviruses or other respiratory diseases would give false positive SARS-CoV-2 antibody test results. Um, and so manufacturers, I think, really focused, and laboratories, like I said, we did earlier, really focused on ha uh, high rates of specificity. However, now that disease prevalence is, or now that prevalence of IgG antibodies are increasing, I think the need for more sensitive SARS-CoV-2 IgG assays is becoming apparent. Um, so even the original assay that I told you about, the S1, S2 IgG assay, um, has what appear to be very good performance specifications. Manufacturer describes the sensitivity of 97.56% and a specificity of 99.3%. How does prevalence impact result interpretation? So in a low prevalence setting, a test even with these excellent performance characteristics has a relatively poor positive predictive value, but the negative predictive value is quite good. As disease prevalence increases, the positive predictive value of the test increases substantially, and you lose a little bit in terms of the negative predictive value. And while one or two percentage points dropped in negative predictive value may not seem like a lot, when you're testing tens of thousands of patients, um, all of whom are testing because they want to know that their vaccines are protecting them, um, this rate of um, false negative results um, is concerning. So when we think about SARS-CoV-2 serology assays, um, we generally think of two uh, different proteins that are targeted. The first is the spike protein. The spike protein is the protein that is most often used for vaccination. And the other is the nucleocapsid protein, um, which is not in the vaccine formulation, so can be used to differentiate infection from vaccination. So the serology tests on the market are generally either anti-spike or anti-nucleocapsid. And today I'm going to focus on spike-based um, serology assay. So what is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein? The SARS-CoV-2 spike is a membrane-bound protein that extends from the viral membrane. It is responsible for the interaction with the ACE2 receptor on the human cell membrane via the receptor binding domain shown here in green. The receptor binding domain um, interacts with the ACE2 receptor and allows for viral entry into the host cell. It is this interaction between spike protein receptor binding domain and the ACE2 receptor that can be the target of neutralizing antibodies which can block this interaction. And that is the basis of things like monoclonal antibody therapy uh, and convalescent plasma. So how does this spike protein exist on the viral surface? Um, it actually exists as a trimer. It is a trimeric protein made up of three independent protomers shown here in red, blue, and green. Um, these three protomers come together to make a trimer, which is the native form of the spike protein on the surface of the virus. <clears throat> so what about SARS-CoV-2 serology? assays, what kinds of capture antigens do they use? So the assay I was telling you about that we initially brought on in our laboratory at the start of the pandemic was an S1, S2 assay that used um, essentially a spike protomer. There are very many assays from many different manufacturers that make use of just the receptor binding domain, the part that interacts with the ACE2 receptor. And today I'm going to tell you about sort of 
the newest advance in capture antigens, which is using the trimeric, the native form of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, which is engineered to hold together as the primer, as a capture antigen. Um, so why is this of relevance? So there's a paper that was published in Pathogenesis and Immunity um, earlier this year that looked at the trimeric form of spike protein and determined that because the native trimeric form of the spike protein has a greater number and diversity of epitopes for antibodies to bind, the, that assays that make use of spike protein tend to be more sensitive than assays that use RBD or spike monomer alone. And so the trimeric IgG, the trimeric spike IgG assay that I'm going to be showing you data on uses paramagnetic particles that are coated with recombinant trimeric SARS-CoV-2 um, spike protein. And those antibodies then can bind in a greater number of conformations around this uh, spike trimer. So what does this do or what effect does this have on um, what effect does prevalence have on this? So again, this is um, the top chart here is the sensitivity and specificity of the S1, S2 assay that I had been, uh, that I showed you before. And the trimeric S assay has slightly better uh, performance characteristics. So roughly similar specificity, just 0.2% better um, and modestly increased sensitivity, um, roughly 1.2% better sensitivity. Now, this may not seem incredibly significant. However, if we look at how these, these changes affect predictive values, you can see that even the positive predictive value at low prevalence is improved um, for this assay. And the, end, the negative predictive value as disease prevalence increases also is improved by one or so percentage points, which again, may not seem like a lot, but in the context of uh, tens of thousands of patients who are testing antibodies after vaccination can become significant. So I'm going to tell you about a study we did uh, looking at the immune response of individuals after a natural infection uh, with SARS-CoV-2. So these were non-vaccinated. This was before the vaccine was available. Um, and this was a study that we did using a trimeric spike assay compared to a receptor binding domain-based IgG assay. Um, so we published this in the Journal of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine earlier this year. <clears throat> and we looked at 1,491 serum specimens using the trimeric S assay and the receptor binding domain-based IgG assay. The vast majority of these specimens were concordant, they matched. Um, but there was a 95.4% overall agreement rate. However, we did have 68 specimens that were discordant. Um, of these, 62 were trimeric S positive, but receptor binding domain negative, and six were trimeric S negative and receptor binding domain positive. So we wanted to break the tie here, and the best way to do this is actually by determining whether neutralizing antibodies were present in these samples. And so a collaborator at the University of Siena in Siena, Italy, um, had a microtiter neutralization assay that they developed for SARS-CoV-2. And so we sent majority of these discordant samples for microtiter neutralization assay testing at the University of Siena. So of the, 60, of the 62 trimeric S positive RBD negatives, two were QNS, but of the remaining 60, the vast majority, 58 out of 60, were also positive for um, neutralizing antibodies. Um, and of the six trimeric S negatives, four were actually negative for neutralizing antibodies. So in summary, after resolution of the discordant samples by the neutralization assay, the trimeric S assay had a 99.7% sensitivity and a 99% specificity. And when compared to the RBD assay, um, specificity is roughly similar. However, you can see that the R the sensitivity of the RBD assay was significantly impaired um, when we're actually looking at the presence of neutralizing antibodies. So that shows, I think, the strength of this trimeric S assay um, in a high prevalence setting. So just to summarize, trimeric S seems to have a very wide dynamic range versus RBD and S1 or S2, and it has excellent sensitivity, which I think is particularly important 
as we move forward to determine vaccine efficacy or antibody responses in, say, immunocompromised individuals. And the final thing I'm going to talk to you about um, is using this trimeric S assay to uh, perform immune status monitoring post vaccination using the Pfizer mRNA vaccine. And this is a study that is ongoing in Alessandria, Italy, um, in healthcare workers. Um, so the, this is the study design, um, 112 eligible subjects, all healthcare workers. There are four time points that are currently available and then one time point that will be available in the future. Um, so time point zero is before the time of the first dose of vaccine. Time point one is 21 days after the first dose, which is the time of the second dose. And time point two is roughly 21 days after the second dose. And time point three is four months after the second dose. Um, to note here, there were slightly more females than males. Um, and more importantly, let, looking at the bottom left chart, the IgG status at baseline, um, the majority of the patients, 97 out of 112, were IgG negative at baseline, meaning they did not have a prior SARS-CoV-2 IgG exposure or infection. And 15 out of 112, 13%, um, were IgG positive at baseline, meaning they had a prior infection with SARS-CoV-2. So um, let's look at the baseline IgG positive patients first. There are 15 of them. Um, the first data point at time zero, which is at the time of the first dose, we can see that all 15 of these patients uh, were above assay cutoff. Um, the average or median antibody level is 130 binding antibody units per ml. Um, 21 days after the first dose, that antibody level increased substantially to 12,000 binding antibody units per ml and it stayed high 20, 21 days after the second dose. Um, fortunately, also four months after second dose, uh, the binding, the titer of antibody did come down a little bit, um, but still remained relatively high. What about in IgG negative patients? So all of these patients were uh, IgG or tested negative on the assay before vaccination or at the time of their first dose. And by 21 days after their first dose, all but one, 96 out of 97 patients were above assay cutoff, showing the presence of um, antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. Um, by time point two, 21 to 24 days after the second dose, all 97 patients were positive at a very robust um, 6,000 binding antibody units per ml. And also in this group of IgG baseline negative patients, uh, four months after their second dose, antibody levels remained quite high, 925 binding antibody units per ml, and all 97 um, still tested positive. So just to summarize, trimeric spike-based serology assays may offer improved sensitivity over other SARS-CoV-2 serology assays. Trimeric S, the trimeric S IgG assay shows excellent clinical performance in naturally infected and recovered individuals. And the trimeric S assay is a good tool to monitor SARS-CoV-2 vaccine response. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much to all the speakers. There were some excellent presentations there. Um, I think that we are now ready to go to the question and answer section. And I think that maybe if also the speakers can switch on their uh, microphone and cameras, then we can see them as well. And now we can see if everybody's there. That's also uh, maybe very useful. Eric, I, I received the message that the Dr. Sambri unfortunately experienced some problems with the connection. So. Uh, we can uh, go to the answer to the other speaker's question, please. Okay. Or all the other speakers can answer the questions of... <laughs> okay. Well, maybe uh, I think it's maybe it's a good thing to start off then with the, the chat session as there were uh, uh, the people in the audience raised their questions. Okay. Ah, I see. Victoria, ciao. Ciao, ciao. So it's already arrived. Yes, yes. 
Can, can you hear us, Dr. Sambri? Sambri, can you hear from us? <laughs> it was a very short visit. Uh, Okay, I, I, maybe we should continue with with the, the question and answers uh, from uh, from uh, the chat. I uh, suggest. Let me have a look. There was a first, uh, so we can switch maybe to the questions for Aurélie, which is I think the first one is from uh, Lisa Slagmelders, and she's asking which internal control you are using, and it's probably then for the. Uh, for the simplex essay, I guess. Uh, yes, okay. So um, about the internal control for the, the simplex essay, so um, uh, it's just uh, an internal control including in the in the region. So just to check if the the process of the PCR uh, is okay. So it's completely independent uh, from the, the sample. So it's yeah, but, 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 well, I think the, uh, what's meant is what, what kind of control is it? Is is it a, a cellular marker or is, is it just a spike of I don't know what the phage which you which you see? Well, I'm not sure of the nature of the of the internal control, but it's not uh, it cannot be related to the cellularity of the sample. So it's not uh, I, I don't think it's a cellular control. Okay. Okay. Okay, and then uh, well, the next question is from Vincent. So Vincent, maybe you can. Uh, Ask the question yourself. Eh? Sure. Uh, oh, it's from me. Ah, yes. Uh, so I was. <laughs> uh, so I was wondering if you have any information on how the quality of specimen collection affects the CT value. I'm, I'm sure, you know, even the differences between a nasal swab and a nasopharyngeal swab are probably um, significant. You can comment on that. Yes, of course, uh, the, the quality of the, uh, the specimen collection has a huge impact on the, on the CT value. We have experienced that uh, millions of times. So uh, we just recommend that the, the sample collection is, uh, is made by um, an experienced uh, healthcare worker. And uh, we recommend the nasopharyngeal specimen and not nasal specimen, if possible. And uh, yes, of course, it's, it's a big question, <laughs> of course. And uh, we also recommend to uh, to uh, test again the patient, so repeat the, the specimen collection in case of discrepancy be between the result of the PCR and the clinical symptoms. And uh, we sometimes uh, have uh, surprises because when we repeat the, the, the specimen collection, the result can be, in fact, uh, positive. So, uh, yes, the, there is an impact, of course. It's <laughs> a big question. Okay, thanks. Eric, Professor Sambri finally is arrived. Uh, yeah, and yeah, sorry. Okay. Yes. Very good, very good. No problem, yes. Well, welcome. We know, we know. Thank you. <laughs> so, there was a, a question for you, Professor Sambri, that is, uh, how did you identify and perform the frequency of testing for antigen for antigen testing? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question. Thanks. Um, of course, it's completely not scheduled. So any laboratory must be able to identify the right frequency of testing in order to achieve the highest possible combination of sensitivity and uh, feasibility. Uh, currently, we do uh, go for uh, uh, testing the population once in a week uh, if the population is a very low risk population, such as the uh, school attendees or uh, people living in a nursing home. So once in a week, uh, uh, it's likely to be a, a reasonable uh, frequency of testing. Of course, if you need to go for a different population, if you need to apply this methodology to a different population, this must be checked again. And it's largely dependent on the uh, ratio of positivity you get uh, in the normal uh, uh, population that gives you a, a relevant information that is the ratio of viral circulation in, in your area, in your population. So, but basically we go for once in a week. 
it's feasible also to go for a, a higher frequency or a lower frequency, of course, but once in a week, it's, it's probably the best combination. Mm -hmm. can, can, I, can I ask you a question maybe? Uh, if you, because you, you mentioned uh, the, the culture positivity yeah, and try to relate that to CT values. Do you think that uh, uh, culture positivity, which is actually an in, in, in vitro sort of sign of, of a replicating virus, will that correlate to in vivo infectiousness? Uh, I would say yes. Um, what I can tell you is that we have right now more than 500 uh, samples try to cultivate uh, in, in uh, vitros in Vero E6 cells with a CT value that was uh, above 33 with the CGN test. And no one of those samples gave a positive replication in the, uh, in the cellular system. Of course, it's, it's a translation. So yeah, you cannot yeah. guarantee that there will be no infectivity. But uh, and I'm, I'm not from sure. a biological point of view, I would say uh, the, the, the in vitro cell system is much more uh, favorable for viral application than the upper pharynx, the upper respiratory tract than the, of, of human beings. So yeah. if the virus cannot replicate in, in vitro, I believe is reasonable to state that the virus will not infect any people. Okay, thanks. Of can, you cannot prove it, of course. That's yeah. true, that's true. Uh, maybe if we have a look in the chat, I think this question is for, uh, for Vincent. The question is from uh, Jorma Hinkula. Well, you can read it here. What about serum IgM or IgA reactivity against the S1, S2 or the uh, uh, receptor binding domain antigens? Are these antibody responses not interesting? Well, uh, they're certainly interesting. Um, I, I think that this question was asked before I mentioned IgM at all um, in the talk. I, I do think IgM has limited utility mainly because of, of timing um, of the IgM response. IgG probably tells us much more information or the same information um, yeah. as IgM. IgA is, I think, a bit more interesting. Um, there is certainly a, a lack of IgA clinical diagnostic assays. Um, and we know that, you know, of course, some neutralizing antibodies will be IgA, um, and some measure of the antibody response will be IgA. Um, especially, you know, it's a respiratory virus that is interacting at mucosal surfaces. So, of course, IgA plays a large role at mucosal surfaces. Um, so it is not uninteresting, but I think it is uh, something where there is the need for more information. Okay, okay, thank you. May, I, the, may I ask you the question? Okay. Sure. Do you believe that the problem with IgM assay is in part due to some di analytical difficulties, I mean, the probabilities of interference, interference much. You're saying interference from I, from IgG causing an IgM assay to be positive, rather than rather than actual, uh, you know, private response for IgM. Yeah, I think it's 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 hard to say. I think because it has been seen in so many different, um, many manufacturer assays have been looked at for IgM and IgG response. And they all seem to have, in general, a very similar pattern or timing. Of, it's not as predictable for, for the IgM, and it's across manufacturers. So I can't say for sure that it is not a, a technical problem. Um, but I think it, it, there may be some biology there. And there are some other viruses where we know um, that IgM doesn't sort of respond the way we would expect it to. Um, I think it's it's possible that it's it's real biology. Okay, and and, and, and this persistent IgM which you, which you found, and the persistent you, IgM which has been reported also is you know we know that that happens in in lots of other viruses as well. Okay, okay. I, I guess I think the data from Israel did not show that. Eh? I think yeah, they had a say pretty normal IgM response. Yeah. Can you? Can one of you maybe think of? what the difference would be there or is it a different in essay or in different no because i think you also had the same essay yeah? 
it's the same assay. I, yeah. I, mean, I, I certainly not every patient has prolonged IgM. It's just it's it's in some subset of patients. I don't off the top of my head recall the percentage. Maybe a quarter of patients, or less than maybe ten percent, ten to twenty percent of patients. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Interesting. There are two related questions to you, Vincent, yeah. about the relationship between trimeric assay and neutralization. Yeah. So, so what, uh, what is your idea? <laughs> so this is another, I think, complicated uh, question to answer. So the data that we have looks, we looked at the discordance using the microtiter neutralization assay to sort of differentiate you know, which result was the, the correct result based on the presence of neutralizing antibodies. Let, 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 let me say that micro-neutralization is not the gold standard, as you know, for neutralizing activity. Cor correct. Because the gold standard is a plaque reduction it's neutralization. PR, it's PRNT, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I finding a laboratory with the ability to Form PRNT right now on for SARS-CoV-2 is was you know not. Call me tomorrow. <laughs> Call you tomorrow. <laughs> um, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. So the the yeah, data no. we have looking at the discordance, I, I think supports in terms of micro neutralization that the trimeric S assay um, certainly has better correlation than the RBD based assay that we looked at to. Uh, look when looking at micro-neutralization. Um, there have also been some published uh, papers that look at whether or not you can correlate IgG to neutralizing antibodies. And it's the field is a little bit mixed. I think more, uh, there are more reports that say that the best indicator of, for the best correlate for neutralizing antibodies is the presence of spike IgG antibody um, but you know, there are also a handful of papers that sort of say that there's not a great correlation between IgG antibodies and neutralization. So I think it's, you know, like a lot of things here with COVID, we've just sort of seen the tip of the iceberg. I think there's a lot left that we don't know. Um, in terms of replacing, I guess there's a question about replacing a neutralizing antibody assay. I think that you know, in a setting where a laboratory is performing a neutralization antibody assay, unless I am mistaken, those really aren't being performed at high throughput. Um, so, you know, if you have a reason to perform a neutralizing antibody assay on a small select number of patients, then I, I think it's good to continue performing that assay. But in terms of mass antibody testing, I, it's obviously I'm sure you know is not really at the moment realistic um, to do a real neutralization assay in, in bulk. Um, so I think that as a proxy for a large number of patients to test um, in a short amount of time, it is reasonable. And the question is to better understand which value of antibodies is related to the neutralization to have a protection. This is the main question we have. Yeah. Um, so we don't, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't have data to really answer this question honestly. Um, I, I think that it's something to be looked at, but I, I, don't, I don't have um, an answer. Thank you. Yeah. And that's this question in the chat from, uh, for, uh, for Adina. Uh, how much time before the single inoculation by a Pfizer vaccine in the 78 non-naive subjects had COVID-19 from Sarah Monticini. Okay. Uh, Non-native patients uh, had a history of at least one positive PCR between March to December 2020. That's all. Okay. Uh, I can add to the... to the correlation of trimeric and different neutral, neutralizing antibody assays. So. Okay. Maybe a very general question. With, with the, the high uh, percentage of vaccinated people in Israel, what's going on with the Delta variant? 
over there. <laughs> the Delta variant. Okay, our laboratory is one of, of two reference laboratories uh, for all COVID positive samples sequencing in Israel. The first case of Delta variant was, was diagnosed in our lab about April 19. After just, after just one month, the prevalence of the variant in Israel became 98%. In patients vaccinated with two Pfizer doses, it looks that the uh, prevention, that pre the prevention of serious illness and death is about 90-60%, a bit lower than for previous variants. However, it is not the case for patients vaccinated with only one dose. Uh, <laughs> uh, most cases is uh, the Delta variant now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, till now, we, we diagnosed more than 1,200 uh, infected patients but, but, with but Delta the, variant. The pressure on hospitals is, is uh, not as bad because of your high vaccination rate, or? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. you know, it's now... Increasing. I, actually, I have another question that, that for, for uh, Aurélie. Uh, in this comparison of these different assays, uh, and then what was it? That SAD had the 10 CT values below all the other ones? Yes. Isn't that just a software thing or something that, that, that <laughs> within, uh, yeah? We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't count the first uh, 10 cycles and then, okay. Yeah, that's an idea. <laughs> Maybe we could tell the... the is manufacturer. It, that's what, that, that was a commercial essay as well? Yeah, it's a commercial essay. Yeah, yeah. I think they did a new version of this essay and uh, probably uh, recalculating yeah. the... And, and add, add, add the 10CT values there to all the results probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, your multiplex essay that you run regularly all through the year, is, mm -hmm. is that the lab developed test or...? Is it a what, sorry? Lab developed in-house. Ah, no, 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 it's a commercial. It's also commercial. No, right. I, I'm not doing in-house PCR. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, in so, any case. So, so, uh, so no problem with the upcoming IVDR then, yeah, the in vitro diagnostic regulation. No. No problem. That's, that's no good. Problem, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I see there's another question in the chat. Uh, let me see. Oh, this, I think this one is probably for uh, uh, for Vincent from Mohammed Nazri Aziz. What is the accuracy of the trimeric SSC in comparison to uh, PRNT? Uh, well, so Dr. Dr. Plavani also asked me yeah. about PRNT. Um, we've not we've not used PRNT. We didn't have access to any laboratory that was able to perform uh, SARS-CoV-2 PRNT. But as Dr. yeah, yeah, you said, uh, it's the, the gold standard for neutralization. Yeah, yeah, right. we, we are collecting this data in my lab. Anyway, in a few weeks, you will have the answer. I hope. Great. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I see a comment from uh, Martin Obermeyer on, on the uh, Abbott M2000 that indeed has 10 cycles pre PCR that are not counted. So. Yes. And this was an Abbott 2000, M2000? Or? Yes, they say ah. this one. So. Okay, problem solved. Good. Thank you, uh, Martin. Thank you. <laughs> and the question for Dr. Adina, also for Mohammed Nazri Aziz. Can you estimate a minimum antibody level to indicate long-term product protective immunity? Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions here? Mario, you had something? I have a question to Vincent because it was very interesting, the lecture. What do you think uh, the role of serological tests with a trimeric or other, uh, particularly uh, in, in this era of vaccination, do you believe that some particular group of subjects should be tested for antibodies? Um, so there's some evidence that some groups, different groups of immunocompromised people respond differently to vaccination. So I think that, uh, you know, for lung transplant recipients, for example, I think are among uh, the worst. I think only one in five lung transplant, vaccinated lung transplant recipients mounted an immune response. So 
you know, I think for the general population, you can trust that the vaccination uh, is effective and you do not need to monitor antibodies post-vaccination. But in a population where you have immunocompromised patients, I, I think that there is a place for serology testing post-vaccination. Thank you. I totally agree with you. Totally mm -hmm. agree. On, on, on these zero reactivity studies after vaccination uh, that you did, did, did you compare the different vaccines as well? Did, did you look at the, did you look at the Janssen Pfizer. vaccine? Sorry, this was just the Pfizer vaccine here. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering if the if the Janssen vaccine, which you only need the one shot, whether that's well, yeah. has a higher level of antibodies. So. There is another question to Vincent. Can you see zero IgG, IgM, IgA reactivity from other respiratory infection against? Uh, COVID-19, uh, this is about the cross-reactivity from other coronavirus particularly, but you uh, provide the evidence of the specificity sure, of training. Yeah. So we had, we had some uh, sera from patients from early in 2019, uh, before COVID certainly was here in the US, um, and there was no observed cross-reactivity for the assay, the trimeric, or the even the previous version of the S1-S2 assay. Thank you, thank you. Yes, this is a very important issue that was fixed uh, uh, in the last, uh, particularly in the last commercially available assays, because if the, the first, uh, uh, the first generation of essay um, did uh, experience some problem of uh, specificity, particularly with other coronavirus. But this seems to be fixed right now. Thank you. Eric, would you like to make the last sentence? Oh, I may, may I? You, may you, I? you, you may. The, the honor you. the honor is all yours thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> so the, <laughs> thank you uh, let me thank and congratulate all the speakers for excellent uh, lectures and I like, I like also to thank uh, dear Sorin for making possible this very interesting session and finally please this night Italy <laughs> should celebrate a victory or should support the Italy, Italy team in this match. Yeah. We're going to have a look. Thank you very much all and also the audience. Thank you for sticking with us and have a great evening and a great rest of the conference. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Eric.